the absolute number one thing that we care about is market size, right? Is the idea big enough that if everything hits and Jesus himself comes down from earth and blesses this company, you can have a multi-billion dollar outcome? That is the number one criteria. One B obviously is the quality of the founders. And I think the quality of the founders is a very subjective thing. And it's, it's hard to kind of put that into words. Like, what are you really looking for? I think it kind of depends um, vertical to vertical. So if we're looking at a gaming company, we normally are looking for repeat founders because we know that gaming is such a hits driven business. You're either, either you have a great game on your hands or you don't. Stars podcast. I'm keeping our investor series for the month going. We have had Elysian Park, uh, we've had Wildcard Ventures, and today we have what I'd like to call like the OGs of the sports tech investment space. I can see Vasu already cracking a smile there. I've got Vasu Kukarni from Courtside VC. Welcome to the show, Vasu. Yeah, it's good to be here. Well, I feel like I'm bigging you up, even though I've known this guy for basically forever. I have to give them credit where credit is due. Courtside is certainly one of, if not the premium sports tech fund. They're now into their third fund, which is one of the reasons that I wanted Vasu to come on the show to talk about what they're doing in sports tech. But yeah, their portfolio speaks for itself. Um, before we get into uh, the fund itself, Vasu, for anybody who doesn't know uh, you or your journey, let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah, How did you get to setting up Courtside? Um, well, it pro- probably starts back to when I was three, four years old and became obsessed with basketball. Uh, yeah, I've, oh, I think I've known the you self, since I was the self-proclaimed biggest basketball fan in the world. Yeah, correct, correct. Uh, which so far nobody has. You know, a lot of lot of people come at me and they're like, mm, I don't know, I might know a guy who's who's uh, who's a bigger fan than you. And then I tell them, listen, I skipped my sister's wedding to go to the final four, and they go, Ah, yeah, maybe. Maybe you've got a problem. Wow. Um, so, you know, so, so, so far, nobody has been able to take that title from me. Um, but, you know, I think I think I probably have known you since I was I don't know, 13, yeah. probably something well, like that. Well, 13, Maybe yeah, even six, six, seventh grade. Yeah, sixth grade, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Se- seventh is uh, so I think seventh grade was when I joined. Uh, when you joined uh, seventh grade. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but I, as you've probably known, I've been obsessed with ball even back then and. You know, a lot of people were obsessed with ball back then. And it, it, it actually hurts me that now, 15, 20 years later, when I still meet up with some of the guys from from school and I ask them if if they still play, they're like, oh, man, you know, I, I haven't really played ball in a couple of years. And I'm like, I, that's crazy to me, given that I literally set up my entire life to be across the street from the basketball courts. I still play ball every other day of the week. And, um, you know, ball is life. And, and I think that's sort of what led me down the path of, starting my first company, which was a sports analytics software company. Uh, this was, shoot, back in 2008, 2009, yeah. when we started at the right, the, the last financial crisis. Um, so that was a, that was a tough, tough journey. You know, my first, my first round of funding that I raised, it took me about a year and a half to raise a pre-seed round. And it was uh, $300,000 at a $1.6 million valuation, right? I mean, times have, times have changed dramatically since then. Um, and after that, you know, all, all of my money throughout the, the life of that company came from individuals. It, I was never able to raise any institutional venture because no VCs believed in the, the, the sports area at all. And, um, and so when we finally got to an exit about a year prior to that, uh, I had gone to my biggest investor, who's a guy named Dan Gilbert owns the Cleveland Cavaliers here in the U S and. You know, we had been we had been talking about venture stuff for years. He had seen me operate a business and he basically said, listen, yeah, like you should you should run a fund and we should sort of be the first uh, sports focused fund out there. And, and you're the guy. I don't know anyone else who should who, who, who knows the space as well as you do. And so I, I got very lucky that that Dan was willing to back us on day one. Um, so in fund one, we, we basically raised 35 million bucks and set out to prove to people that sports was actually an investable, uh, an investable category where you could generate venture returns. And, um, you know, here, here we are seven years later with uh, a third fund. So that, you know, over $200 million under management. And yeah, that's hopefully a a pretty good stamp of approval from LPs that, that, you know, having a differentiated strategy in this space, um, can actually generate returns that they need. 
Yeah, speaking of stamp of approval, I have to give a couple of shout outs to this guy. Uh, annoyingly, he was the best player, best basketball player, which is not to say a lot, by the way, there weren't too many great <laughs> right, basketball right. players. The bar was very low. <laughs> the bar was pretty low. But like, we, we, it was pretty great to see uh, to articulate it for our school team and then the high school that we went to, we went to the same high school as well. Uh, and he was by far the best player there as well. And then she built up a career and started his first company and also a few parallels there. We both started up our first ventures at the same time, 2009. We both started up slightly different directions we've gone in. Um, he went to New York. Eventually, was he's at, I'm in Berlin now, so yeah, not, not too bad. I think we've done, we've done all right. Um, I think what's done more than all right is actually the Courtside Fund. Yeah, you already mentioned you're under $200 uh, million in management. So let's see where some of this $200 million has been spent. I'm looking at your portfolio right now, and it is, uh, you have to say, a who's who of sports tech investments. Veo, one of their recent companies, The Athletic, Bought over by the New York Times, StockX, probably one of your uh, fund highlights. Um, and I can I could go on and on. Dibs, the Drone Racing League. So tell me, first, how did this idea, or let's say you've already said that, Dan Gilbert, and you spoke about, let's create a sports tech-focused fund. But at that time, did you genuinely feel that sports tech on its own was big enough to support venture back money? And interestingly, do you still believe that? Because I feel like your your fund has taken a few interesting turns over the last few years. Yeah. So right off the bat from day one, I was extremely worried that we were not going to be able to have a 30, 30 company, 40 company portfolio right. if we focus purely on sports. And so you know, one of the first things I actually did, um, which now I remember thinking back to, like I went back to Dan and his people and I was like, guys, you have to carve out a bit of this fund for me to do whatever I want with it, right? Like whether it's enterprise SaaS, whether it's consumer, like I need at least like a third of this fund to be whatever. And they were like, no, like we didn't give you money to go be a generalist VC. There's plenty of guys that we've given money to, to do that. You're good at one thing and you know the sports world better than anyone else. So you need to stick to what you're good at. And, and that was great advice because the fact of the matter is, I don't know what I'm doing if I were to just be a generalist VC. I've, I've done well as an angel, but like the reality is being a generalist today is extremely difficult. You're now competing against the Andreessen's, the Sequoia's, the Kleiner's. Like there's 200 funds that focus on all that stuff and they probably have better access than we ever will. And, and so it was very good advice for them to say, no, stick to your guns. Now, that being said, the word sports has historically been extremely narrowly defined. It was, okay, you're, you're selling products to teams and athletes. That 100% is not a big enough opportunity. Um, and we realized that very quickly. So in fund one, we said, all right, sports, the thing that we're probably most interested in is media. Um, that's where a lot of the dollars are. Fitness and wellness certainly falls under sports. And it's sort of where the uh, the people that have purchasing power, the guys who graduate from college, they're 22 plus, they have jobs, they're living in the coasts in the US and they want to stay healthy. Those people are willing to spend an outrageous amount of money on their health and wellness. So that to us was an extension of the, of the word sports. And then back in 2016, when we launched, esports was sort of the flavor of the week. And so we said, all right, we're going to focus on esports as well, uh, because, well, the word sports is in it. So, yeah, we, we should be able to make the case for that. So fund one, really the focus was sports media. It was uh, fitness and wellness. And then it was esports. Out of that fund, you know, the, the, the biggest deals that we did, obviously, the athletic was a sports media deal. StockX was sort of a, I, you know, I, it doesn't really fall into any of those categories, to be honest. You know, sneaker culture transcends sports and we made the case for it and thank God we did because that, that deal returned our entire fund. Um, we invest in a company called hundred thieves, which was sort of incubated out of our fund, which has become one of the biggest esports brands out there. Um, in Europe, we invest in a company called freeletics, which is Europe's biggest fitness app. So you could clearly see the theme going into fund two. We sort of said, okay, esports hasn't really panned out. Like hundred thieves was a tremendous investment because they built a lifestyle brand, not because they are, a great esports team, um, and so esports. When you look at it as a as a function of the larger gaming ecosystem, it's like 0.5 percent of what the actual revenues in the gaming world are, right? And so we said, look, we got to be a gaming fund. Like we have to have a deep focus on gaming, not just on esports. 
but Deepin and I, my partner, we were not gaming guys at all. Neither of us had played a game in probably 20 years. And so we said, well, we got to go find a guy who knows what he's doing in the gaming sphere. And so we went and found our third partner, Kai Bond, who was leading gaming for Comcast Ventures and convinced him to come over. Um, so Fun 2 was very much a sports gaming and a little bit of fitness. And then towards the end of Fun 2, we were in the pan- middle of the pandemic and we saw the collectibles market go crazy. Um, we saw trading cards go from, you know, a, a Michael Jordan rookie card was trading for maybe 20 grand. And it, in, in a span of about six months, it went from 20 grand to, to $750,000 on, 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 on eBay, right? And so we're sitting here going, okay, like there's something to this collectible space. We saw StockX, we saw the rise of sneakers becoming an asset class. We're now seeing it with trading cards. Memorabilia is going to be next. We're going to, and I've been a watch guy for a while. Watches were blowing up during the, the pandemic. And so I sort of shifted all of my focus at that moment um, from, from sports into collectibles. And so today, if you look at where most of our money is going in fund three, I'd say we're really a gaming fund, a collectibles fund, and a real money sports sports gaming fund, right? So uh, sports betting in the U.S. has obviously become massive with the change in regulation, but we're also looking globally at at new emerging markets where uh, sports betting has not yet been legalized, and we're going and investing in the best uh, daily fantasy company out there in the hope that we will be able to get a sports betting license one day or that we're going to get acquired when sports betting becomes regulated and a fan duel draft Kings bet three, six, five, whoever wants to enter that market is going to need a consumer base. And we already have it. Um, so really we've, we've changed our focus very much from fund one to fund two. Now fund three, you can see um, really the only places we're putting money to work are real money, gaming, collectible platforms and, and, um, and just pure play gaming. And I totally believe that. I remember the first, basically, when I started my own sports tech journey, which was, I think, in 2016, 17, when I was exploring the space, Vasu was basically the first guy I called. And I had no idea what, what you were doing. Or I knew about crossover. I knew a little bit about courtside. Um, but I remember talking to you then, and I remember the, what you said to me was exactly described your mandate for Fund One. You said, sports is interesting and sports technology is interesting, but it has to be bigger than that. There has to be media. There has to be fitness, there has to be stuff that fills out. Today, you look at, you're now going into a specialization almost within sports, whether it's collectibles or whether it's real money gaming, because also there are so many more funds today than probably certainly ever have been. Like, I think I think I wrote an article on a newsletter a few months, or last month or something about just in the last three months, how many funds have either announced the next fund uh, iteration. So it's a fund two or fund three between KB, Sapphire, you guys, Will Ventures, all announced new funds, apart from new funds being launched, which is whether it's Venture Rock or Dawan or Playtime. Now, how much of the money that all these funds have is real or not is another conversation. But certainly this space is crowded or getting more crowded. Do you think that there is still more room for more funds and more specialization as we emerge? Or just generally, there's more headroom to grow in sports and sports technology? Yeah, I, I mean, look, there's there's no end to the number of companies that are coming out there. Should they all be funded is a whole different question, <laughs> right? And the, the problem with having so many funds in a very small space will be that invariably funds will start to do bad deals yeah. because they don't they miss out on you know the one they should have done, and then they go, well, we only have a a, a small silo of deals to choose from. This one seems pretty good even though the reality is that that deal probably should not get funded, at least not funded by a VC. You know, that's the big thing about sports. There are a lot of great companies in sports tech that should never be venture funded. They should be angel funded. They should be bootstrapped. They should get to profitability and they'll get acquired, but they're never going to get acquired for massive amounts of money because unfortunately the sports tech ecosystem is still in its very early days. There are no massive companies that have, you know, 20, 30, 40 billion dollar market caps that can come out and make a one billion dollar, two billion dollar acquisition. It just doesn't exist. Um, and and as a result, you know, you you look at the athletic, like they had to be bought by the New York Times. They had to be bought by the largest general digital publisher to have an exit. There was nobody else that was ready to buy that business. 
And it still wasn't a billion dollar outcome. It was very good for us because we led the seed, led the A, came back in the B, we stayed on the board. So it was a great outcome. But the fact of the matter is if, if we hadn't been the lead investor and we had just written like a $200,000, $300,000 check into that business, it, it wouldn't have been a great outcome at a $500 million exit uh, number. And so um, that's the biggest issue is still that this space is very market cap constrained. Um, and as a result, I think everyone is sort of branching out and looking at different verticals or, or different ideas within these verticals that could have larger implications beyond just sports. So look, in general, more VCs is good. It creates more competition. It's better for the founders. There's more access to capital. All of that is good. My worry also just becomes if there's too many funds with too much money, do we either A, start pricing each other up on deals that should never get priced up to that number? Or do we start doing bad deals, which then sends a bad message to LPs when when a sports tech fund doesn't do well and doesn't return capital to investors, does the entire space get a bad name? You know, we don't want that to happen either. And so, you know, we're, we're very cautious about the way we also describe our fund. I mean, we don't call ourselves a sports tech fund because, I mean, fundamentally, if you look at our at our portfolio, I don't think you're going to see more than five to seven percent of the portfolio in pure play sports tech deals. But it all comes down to like, how do you define the word sports again? Right. Um, and if, you know, if, if a sports collectibles deal, is that a collectibles deal or is that a sports deal? I'd argue it's kind of both, right? Um, you know, is Dapper Labs, we're not investors, but, you know, is that a blockchain Web3 deal? Is that a collectibles deal? Is that a sports deal? And I'd argue it's kind of all three of those things. Um, so there's a lot of those intersections of these of these new types of monetization, new types of technology. You know, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time looking at generative AI right now. Obviously, that is the flavor of the week. However, it's how do we apply generative AI to the world of gaming, to the world of sports, to the world of fitness and wellness? And are there some interesting plays there where, you know, this company could get acquired by a massive company because it's, a, it's an AI company, but all of the use cases fall within sports and, and gaming where we can be helpful to the company. So that those are the sorts of issues that we sort of have to deal with. That's a great point. I think that's something that we get asked all the time about how you really define sports tech. And my answer is if the company is interested in sports, whatever the solution is, then I'll, and if it has some sort of technology play, then we'll call it sports tech. Uh, uh, the right. exact example that you gave of Dapper Labs, I don't think you'd, if, if you ask Dapper Labs themselves, they probably don't identify as a sports tech company, but they have a really good, incredible tech solution that, which has worked incredibly in sports. So we'll put them in into yep. our reports to, to show that the space is big. That's how that's how we play the game. Right. Anyway. Right. But so let's let's <laughs> come let's come to let's come to the startups that you that you focus on. You mentioned in your previous answer about the areas that you're investing in, collectibles and real money gaming, especially is one. And we're seeing legalization of sports betting across the wave has swept across the US, has gone further south to Brazil. Uh, it's making a pit stop by India. It's already legalized in Japan. So there are markets opening up certainly. Um, what kind of startups, let's say what scale um, what let's say what kind of founders do you usually look at like what kind of criteria do you use to evaluate across whatever work, verticals not just real money gaming across verticals what does a founder take to get interest from uh, founder need to get interest from code side like the, the, the absolute number one thing that we care about is market size right is the idea big enough that if everything hits and jesus himself comes down from earth and blesses this company you can have a multi-billion dollar outcome that is the number one criteria so that's 1A. 1B, obviously, is the quality of the founders. And I think the quality of the founders is a very subjective thing. And it's right. it's hard to kind of put that into words. Like, what are you really looking for? I think it kind of depends um, vertical to vertical. So if we're looking at a gaming company that is creating actual, let's say, mobile games or a gaming uh, publisher, and they're going to put out games, we normally are looking for repeat founders because we know that gaming is such a hits-driven business. You're either, either you have a great game on your hands or you don't. And there are so many little things to game mechanics that are hard for a first time founder to figure out. Not that it's impossible, but again, with, with limited bets that we have to place in this space, we can't necessarily take the riskiest of bets. And so oftentimes we'll say, you know, if you're building an actual game, we want to see that it's a founder that's done this before, whether or not they've been wildly successful is, is not a big deal, but if they've done it before, they've been through the grinder and they understand what it takes to build a successful game. Um, you know, with, with a lot of the things that we do in sports, when it comes down to relationships with sports leagues and teams and players, you know, we're looking at guys perhaps who have 
been in a role before in their past life where they've had those relationships already and they're able to 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 have the domain expertise and the and the rolodex to call on people instantly as opposed to it taking 6 months to get a meeting they're able to get it in one day because they already know know a lot of these folks um and a lot of times it's also just you know the you make you make a lot of your early stage bets based on gut as much as i hate to say it like that is really the role of an, of a very early stage vc which is what we are we we place pre seed bets we play seed bets occasionally we'll do series a's um but really our sweet spot is hey there's a great founder or a founding team they've got a, an idea that we think can be massive maybe they've done they've prototyped the first version of this product it may not even be live yet and they're looking for 2 million bucks to kind of get this thing to to see if there's product market fit and we can be 1 million of that 2 million that's our that's our ideal stage right and so there isn't much to go on there isn't a lot of data to look at because the product is not yet live so really it's a it's a gut based decision that you're making looking at the market size looking at what they've built looking at their history all of that but still you sometimes just have to sit face to face with a founder and be like is this a person that i think is going to spend the next 10 years of their life running through walls and w- listen we're still wrong 75% of the time we're wrong on our bets that's venture it's it's crazy when you think about how bad the numbers really are and the chances of 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 true success but listen there's there's no more fun job in the world in my opinion maybe there'll be a generative ai analyst who'll come and make better suggestions <laughs> at some point I, I got said i got said just the other day i got sent a chat message uh somebody asking uh chat gpt about hey can you give us good hr tech startups uh in in the us and actually had a list of five so i quickly went in and looked for something in sports tech and it didn't have anything yet so that's something that, that that's something that <laughs> there you go at. but um <laughs> But yeah, coming coming back to what you said. So okay, obviously the size of the market and the conviction of the founder, let's say, are two really important criteria that help you find your gut in the right way or find the right thing in your gut, which makes you say, which makes you say yes. Is that a fair thing to say? Yeah, I mean, there there's an aspect of that, and then you know we internally have tried to quantify all of this. So we have like we have 19 different criteria that we grade every deal on every every one of our partners grades every company that has reached a partner meeting on this grade 1 1 to 4 19 different criteria so the max score you can get is like a 74 and we've now created like a benchmarking system and so as soon as we grade a deal at the very least we can see like where does it grade on our list of all the deals we've seen and if it's too far below i think right now our threshold is something like 62 or 63 out of 74 means okay we should take this deal very very seriously if it grades like a 51 52 you're like there's no way we're going to do this deal and if it's somewhere in the middle that's when we kind of rely on the partner who's leading the deal to say hey man are you pounding the table for this deal do you have that much conviction in the founder and the idea what have you like do you really want to stick your neck out for this deal do you feel that strongly about it and sometimes you know our partner will be like no nah, i just i don't feel that strongly about it i i wanted to see what everyone else thought and we're like well look that just means we should probably not do this deal but if a guy's pounding the table you know 9 times out of 10 all the other partners here will be supportive and say listen as long as it's a you know it's a reasonably you're not you're not writing a 5 million dollar check you're writing a 1 million dollar check okay like it, it it graded it wasn't high enough that it was a guarantee that we should do it but it wasn't low enough that we shouldn't do it it's right on the fence great now is where your gut comes in and we go how how strongly do you believe in this deal and we'll back you if that's the case perfect uh, last one on that section um so how many deals do you guys lead versus how many do you do uh, like what percentage breakup are you lead versus a, a tag on tag along investor i mean we're we're three partners so the reality is you know we don't think that each of us can really take on more than call it 3 to 4 board seats max per fund uh and so you know if we're doing 30 deals that really means we're leading let's call it 10 so it's one out of every 3 deals at most that we can lead fair and do you get a lot of your deals from inflow or like people reaching out to you or this is through recommendations or you guys go out actively looking for your own deals it's a little bit of everything of i course. think um the good news for us like being issue? so vertically focused is that a lot of funds reach out to us uh because they 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 know that we've seen everything in the space and right. so 
we're just another data point for them. So probably, you know, I'd say 40 to 50% of our deals come from other VCs, another 10 to 20% come from founders in our network who've seen something that they think we'd like. Another 10 to 15% is just cold outreach from founders. And once in a while, I mean, Veo actually is a perfect example. That, that was actually a combo. So the last piece of, of how we find deals is we have a thesis around a space. We refine that thesis. And then we say, let's go out and find a company that meets the criteria. And so Veo, I had this thesis for a long time that somebody needed to build a camera that cost less than $1,000 that could be deployed on every sports field around the world. It had to be fully portable. It couldn't be fixed mount because you play half your games at, at somebody else's stadium or, or somebody else's pitch. Um, and the cost needed to be under a grand because I said, you can go buy a, a Sony camcorder that's pretty high def for you know five, 600 bucks. So it's really hard if you have a $5,000 solution for youth sports leagues to buy that. And so I had this thesis. I was looking everywhere for a company. And then Veo sent us a cold inbound email. And I opened the deck and I go, holy shit, these guys have built exactly the thing that I've been looking for. I flew to Denmark and led their, their Series A immediately, right? Um, so that's really the way in which sometimes things come together. But that's obviously a rare example, I'd say, of of a cold email meeting our criteria perfectly. Understood. And now it seems like there are so many of these less than $1,000 uh, companies which there are, are which have automated cameras and stuff. Um, last couple of questions before we drop off. Um, I know we already covered trends. You already said, I mean, basically the trends that you're most bullish about, um, as you mentioned, the real money gaming, collectibles, and I think you, you spoke about so what was the third one? Real money gaming, collectibles? Uh, just, uh, just gaming, just gaming. In gaming in in, 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 Anything in else general. you want to add yeah. is like an area of special interest? I mean, right now, like the generative AI stuff is really interesting, right? I mean, obviously everyone's talking about it, but specifically as it relates to our verticals, you know, we have a company called Hypothetic, which basically started off creating 2D to 3D models. So you could literally sketch like a stick figure of a dog you could scan it in and within 10 seconds, it can convert that into a 3D object that can be placed into a game, right? It's pretty cool. And they've now gotten into actually managing all of these assets because when you think about the amount of time game developers spend on just the artwork inside of a game, that's yeah. the bulk of their time, right? Yeah. The the actual, and not that the coding is, is trivial, but that can be done, but the actual graphical assets that go into a game is what you'd spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions of man hours on. And the fact that generative AI can now create exactly the 3D model you want and you can dump into a game is, it's mind blowing. And so that's an example of taking generative AI, but applying it specifically to a vertical that we're interested in. And, and so we're spending a lot more time on that. Makes a lot of sense. All right, what's coming up for Courtside? Uh, obviously, Fund 3 is good, already, already deployed maybe in action. Um, anything else around that's coming up for you guys that you're looking out for especially? Um, we, I mean, we're, we're continuing to deploy. I think we'll probably be done with Fund 3 by, yeah, hopefully the end of this year, maybe but sometime did, did early next year we'll be done. Fund 3? Like to be fair, ago? we just announced, but we'd been, but we, <laughs> we'd been spending that money for, uh, for a while before we I announced. Agree. And so, yeah, we're, we're about uh, 28 or 29 deals deep already yeah. uh, out of Fund 3. So um, maybe another five to six deals left in this fund. And then um, ho hopefully we've, we've got enough uh, numbers to show from fund one and fund two that we can raise a fund four. Yeah, sounds like it. Sounds like you're already on your fund four roadshow. Maybe that's the call that you're jumping into next. Um, <laughs> all right, man, uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep conscious of time, but so I'll give you my last question. This is my favorite question to ask. Uh, you've got a great perspective on what Courtside is about, um, but as we started, we all know that we're sports fans first. So I want to know what has been your favorite sporting moment, either as a fan or maybe even as an athlete that you want to share. Cool. Don't, don't I mean, say there, it was the there final just... four where you missed your sister's wedding. Just please don't say that. No, no. <laughs> there, there, there have been too many great sporting events that I've been lucky enough to be at. I mean, I, we could spend an entire podcast talking about the places I've been to. I would say of all of the, of the moments for me, um, this past year, you know, my Warriors had been plagued with injuries. I'm in a chat group with about 200 super NBA fans from around the world that are just, unfortunately, most of them are Laker fans, so they're the worst people on earth. And uh, and they just talk shit nonstop about Steph Curry and the Warriors. And so in November of last year, just three weeks into the season, I publicly guaranteed that the Golden State Warriors would win a championship, which is wow. which is suicide yeah, to, to go into this group absurd. and say that. Yeah. So. 
I was ridiculed for six months, the amount of shit people talked at me, and to be there in game six in Boston when we won the championship, and to be at the after party afterwards with Steph and the guys, that will probably, it was the sweetest championship ever for me. So it sounds like it must have been that, pretty that, sweet That's got to take well. it right now. Yeah, I, I think I saw the videos of uh, the party the next day in, in the Bay Area and Clay coming on the boat. And there were so many videos uh, <laughs> running around. It seemed like a great time. It sounds like you had a great time as well, man. And uh, it sounds like it's been a great journey so far. And long may it continue. Let's keep at it. 100%. All right. Vasu, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. For sure, um, man. It's been a pleasure to have you uh, on board. And uh, yeah, if anybody wants to reach out to you and you want to find another amazing inbound deal, where, where should they find you? What are your coordinates? Uh, you can go on our website. Uh, you can email us at hello at courtsidevc.com. I'm also on Twitter uh, at Vasu, so you can always yeah. tweet at me. Yeah, I know Vasu is less active on LinkedIn, so probably not there. Maybe Twitter or, as he said, courtsidevc.com, <laughs> and they have a contact tab there that you could reach out to them. All right, uh, thanks so much, Vasu. Have a good one. Thanks for having me. All right, See guys, you. that's a wrap for another episode. Uh, that's I think we have one more episode left in our investor series. And next month... We're actually going to be doing a Middle East focused series. I'm really loving these themes. We did fan experiences last month. We did new investors this month. And Middle East is coming up as a really interesting sports tech destination. We've got a couple of events, got a couple of startups, and an investor lined up for you guys as well. All right. So see you guys then.